Hello everyone and welcome to GM's Brew. This is our uh, weekly show where I'm going to be doing some uh, homebrew and game design. Uh, see here, how are we all doing today? Uh, let's see here. Last week we did the, a um, crew for the Brass Knuckle, the Spelljammer ship that we did up the week before. This has all been part of a uh, ongoing project, Spelljammer project which, uh, once it's all finished up, is going to end up on uh, the DM's Guild, hopefully, and uh, for Pay What You Want, and hopefully people like support, like it, support the stream a little bit, stuff like that. So we're not going to launch right into that. want to get a little couple of announcements done beforehand. Uh, we are still sitting one follower short of doing a dice giveaway this Sunday. Um, since we didn't do a dice giveaway last Sunday... If we get that one follower, we'll do one dice giveaway. And if we get another five followers to get us up to our weekly goal of 40, then we will do a second dice giveaway uh, during the stream. So that's an important thing. Uh, really want to try and get our follower numbers up. Our big goal right now is to get to 50 followers pretty soon. Uh, when we do get to 50 followers, we're going to be doing another big giveaway like we did earlier. Let's see here now. Who we got with us today? Hey, hon. Uh, Ziva's uh, sitting in here with us in the chat. She'll be happy to chat with anyone that shows up and talks to you. Making promises for her. She can't say no. So, let's buy a little time while I get some. Oh, oh, I always forget to turn that back on. Uh <sighs> Where is that logo? There we go. Okay. There we go. Logo's back. Sorry about that. I keep on fiddling with the overlay because trying to find some way to make it work. I blame Tux for many things. I blame Tux for many things. So let's see here now. So what we're going to be doing is a um, mission for uh to go along with the brass knuckle and its crew this is going to be something that you can generally like get the whole document hand out the crew or have play people make uh their own character level one characters and run them through a one-shot adventure just to get them used to the idea so this isn't going to have a lot of like plot hooks built into it they'll grab out to other places this is more of a foundational thing let's see here so what we're going to do is get started with the setting information first. Did the music cut off? No, the music didn't cut off. Okay. Pulling up my paperwork. So, I'm going to partially be using the um, island generator from uh, Ghost of Shark Salt Marsh. It's a nice little uh, set of tables that can provide a branching thing and uh, the original intent was like this is what an island is that your players may stumble upon while you're out sailing the open sea. The same concept it can be used for um, pretty much anything else. It could be a forest enclave or it could be a random city or it could be in this case a planet or an asteroid. So first we're going to develop a theme for it. And the random thing for Sanctum, huh? Okay, so theme Sanctum. It does not necessarily mean it's a friendly location. Could be like, you know, a religious order religious order that doesn't necessarily like having uh, visitors. Or it could be um, guarding something. So we'll see where we're going on. Let's go ahead and get just a general idea for the leader. Who is an archmage. See, I'm already seeing like a kind of idea of the archmage has set up here as a sort of protectorate, keeping something, say, uh, keeping something away from the the planes in general. 
but he can't just be living there by himself, so let's see what inhabitants there are. Let's see here. Oh, that's kind of works with it. I have 1d6. Now, the base, the thing says flesh golems, which are pretty high ratings as it is, and they just go up and higher in there, but I'm just going to make that golems. To make it a little less uh, macabre right off the start. Nothing wrong with macabre, but yeah. Let's see here. Then also 1d4 priests. And finally 2d10 acolytes. Let's see here. And now the reactions to people showing up. So the inhabitants hunger for information about the outside world. For information. And allow the characters to use news as currency. Since this is going to be mostly a one-shot, or like the introductory adventure, the character, this actually is going to give like a huge roleplay opportunity to the players, because basically they can make something up, and the, G, the GM can later use that as later hooks to develop what's going on in the game, or in the outside world, or just as a strong roleplay opportunity. So, let's see here. Story hook. Because that's one of the most important things. You want a one-shot to be pretty quick off the bat on getting into the what's going on. So, let's see here. Ooh. Let's see. So, story hooks. The island has an armory. Okay, so I rolled up four, which is the island has an armory full of legendary adamantine and silvered weapons. So this is a really good start. This has, like, uh, some built-in rewards and a built-in motivator, because, like, what player doesn't want to get their hands on, like, some high-powered uh, magic weapons at the very beginning. Even if they're not able to keep it, or even if, like, it has to be fully awakened, it's still, like, a good draw. So, I mean, that's just the basis of this now. Uh, what we're going to be doing is using what's called the uh, five-room dungeon template method that was, um, it's generally uh, credited to John 4. And it's just a matter of creating a series of uh, encounters that feel challenging to players and, uh, oh, the adventure generator I used was, um, the templates out of the back of, uh, the Ghost of Salt Marsh. There is a section there called, um, Islands, and you can use that to randomly generate a number of islands. And I just am adapting that to um, the idea of the Planescape. Uh, not Planescape. Adapting that to the idea of the Spelljammer. I always forget to turn off the little thing. So every time I do this, y'all seem to get a behind the scenes of me having poor grammar and spelling. Okay. Turn that back to that. Okay, there we go. So, where was I? Right, uh, the Five Room Dungeon. Five Room Dungeon, um, it's generally credit, credited to a person called John Four. He writes for, I think, Storlands or something like that. Uh, you can find him just by searching, like, uh, roleplay, um, searching Five Room Dungeon, um, I'm trying to remember his actual website name. I'm kicking myself now. 
I think it's like, I want to say it's roleplayingtips.com. Yeah, search for roleplayingtips.com. He has a blog. He sends out emails on making suggestions and ideas. It's a really great resource for people, uh, especially for dungeon masters. But basically, the five-room dungeon, and it doesn't have to be in a dungeon. It doesn't have to be rooms. You could have, like... It's basically a series of encounters that flush out into a full series. So it could be uh, hopping from one island to the next. It could be rooms in a dungeon. It could be uh, a mission throughout the city as the players hunt something down. Or just traveling through the woods. But it's a good template. Uh, definitely find it, use it. Uh, it it's wonderful for one-shots. So room one generally has an entrance and a guardian. Room 2 generally has a puzzle or a role-playing challenge. Room 3 generally has a trick or a setback. Room four is the climax, the big battle, or some other conflict. And finally, room five, the room all the players want to get to. Reward, Revelation, and for you Dungeon Masters out there, Plot Twist. Because the adventure never has to stop at that Room 5. The Room 5 can be used as a hook to set the next leg of the game. So, let's see here now. Pulling up some little bits of this, a little bit of that. Okay, so let's start with the entrance and the guardian. So right now, looking at like what we have, theme of sanctum. The leader is an archmage. It has a number of golems, priests, and acolytes. They are hungry for information about the outside world, and the reason the players are there is the island has an armory full of legendary adamantine and silver weapons. So we don't have anything really flushed out just yet from that but we do have a good basis for stuff so we know the players are there for the weapons the weapons are the weapons can either be there and being protected by the archmage which forces the players into confrontation with the inhabitants of it and that could work if you're wanting to do this as like um you know not necessarily good line characters or you want to throw some moral uh, choices into there to force the players like well are you going to fight these people that are protecting these powerful weapons so that the rest of the galaxy doesn't uh, isn't threatened but that's a little yeah I could definitely see this being like a forge world where uh, the priests and the acolytes and the golems are all dwarves and the archmage is the head crafter who designs them uh, designs the uh, stuff and in that way we can do this as kind of a factory but either way unless you want the players to be like coming in and attacking like these it's better to have the fur them there to retrieve something and oh we would help you but we can't get access to it because of this has happened and so if you clear out the danger that's keeping us from getting into the armory we will let you have what you need so the first entrance the entrance and the guardian this is uh this encounter is a couple different ideas it could be the entrance is trapped or hidden in some way or you have to have a some MacGuffin to even let you into that and the, I like I like the idea of having to have the MacGuffin to get into it so 
requires a key in possession of me. And we'll go back in and fill stuff in later, like the name of the Archmage and how many actual golems and priests and acolytes there are. But right now we're just doing a bare bones. So room one, it requires a key in possession of the Archmage, which means the pet characters need to land there, get um, get into the presence of the Archmage, and get his permission to go in. And even then, they will have to deal with the Guardian. So... Let's see here. Rooms. Room is guarded. And we already have a couple examples. Um, problem is golems are really high level and these are kind of like expecting to be a one shot or a low level introductory. So let's pull up our handy dandy little thing of monsters. Let's limit it to constructs right now. And we want a difficult but not impossible challenge. So we're doing a couple of assumptions here that these are level one or in uh, level one characters or the NPCs we created in our previous ones. So let's say it's guarded by, hmm. See, if you do a lot of small uh, creatures that, um, it's easy to get the big hits on and do a lot of damage to. Uh, the players will get like, oh yeah, I'm feeling strong and powerful and uh, more encouraged to continue on in like the game. So we're not going to go with like a single huge tough guy. We're going to go with three or four um, lower level difficult but not impossible to beat things so what we're going to do is hmm there's a couple options uh, but I really like using yeah well it's from non earth or can uh, on our a chemical wow constructs there's not a lot of low level options for which makes sense so a medium encounter difficult but not deadly so it's guarded by if you have the Mordekainen's Tome of Foes there are a lot of constructs in there that are really good and have a lot of role play and flavor options available so we're going to go with the bronze scout from them oh hey equilibrium uh, how you doing we're doing a little bit of uh, adventure generation today let's see here so is guarded by a bronze and the bronze scout is I'm trying to remember the description of it I believe the bronze scout is kind of a um, clockwork worm thing with like bang. let's see here it kind of stays underground most of the time and uh, looking at the stat block earth armor so doesn't provide academic so yeah this is very much a this thing is hiding out in here and we haven't been able to get past it because we're not warriors and stuff like that we're craftsmen and it's very much an ambush thing so I can see the party like gain the key that they open from the uh, they acquired from the Archmage after some roleplay, opening into this big kind of earthen chamber, and just like nothing is there. It seems to completely abandoned. They take a couple steps out, and then it leaps out to attack, and it can, you can force a surprise round on the players. I'm about to sneeze. Ah, sorry about that. Allergies are just wrecking me. Uh. Okay, let's see here. Mm. Ooh, shook myself, uh, shook my head a bit. That's 
hopefully the last sneeze. Sorry. It's the end of summer and my allergies are just killing me. But yeah, no. Um, yeah, I think Bronze Scout would be a good one. It has a, a recharge ability. But it's a single use and it requires a shorter long rest afterwards. So it can get one good shot off on the players. Basically, each creature in contact with the ground within 15 feet of the Bronze Scout must make a DC 13 dexterity saving throw. Taking 14 lightning damage, 46 on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. So that's either good for like the it launches into combat with this and puts everyone like on their heels or it's just about to go down and it uses this as a last resort before trying to flee. That's up to the DM how they uh, run that. So, I'm going to kind of collapse these so it stands out a bit more. Okay, so that's the monster, the initial monster challenge. Let's see, the second room is generally a puzzle or role playing challenge. Now, just getting to the dungeon will require some role playing. Convincing the uh, Acolytes and the Priests to let them see the Archmage, and then convincing the Archmage to let them have access to the Armory if they can beat the challenges therein. So, I think a puzzle is a good option. Now, let's see here. And puzzles can be like, you know... It could be a chessboard tile, and if you're doing this in person, you can break out a chessboard and make your players play a, a game of chess versus you where they have to agree on the movements, but you get to make whatever move you want. Or, um... Hmm... I, I really like, like, um... I've seen this in a couple different uh, variations. Uh, the descending roof puzzle, the uh, the countdown timer puzzle, the one button puzzle, where basically you have to wait until it looks like the puzzle is a, uh, going to kill you, and then it resets and the door opens. But that's a little cerebral for... Uh, players and they can tend to overthink it. That's like right up there with the, the only way to get past the door is to say please to the door. Uh, that I believe XP to level 3 talked about in one of their videos. So puzzle tile. Hmm. I'm a fan of riddles. So going to pull up my little uh, riddle sheet and see if I can find a good one for this. T -t 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 -t. Riddle, riddles. Riddle, riddle. So. Hmm. Okay, I like this one. Players must solve And, okay, so, I'm thinking that there's, like, several objects or um, images carved in, around the room of, like, a chess set, an apple, a tree, stuff like that, or, and then written in, like, different languages throughout the room is the riddle, which is 30 men... But only two women. What yet? These two hold the most power. Dressed in black and white, they could fight forever. F O R E V E R. Who are they? And then uh, 
And of course you can change this around if you have a different riddle or if you have Yeah, I'm going to do um, a few monsters and a settlement next week. But yeah, this is like just a very basic riddle. 30 minute, but only two women, yet these two hold the most power. So you can disguise it a little bit. You can make it like a series of carvings of two armies locked in an eternal war with a queen overseeing each of them as like a huge mural along the wall. And hidden throughout the room, there could be little chess pieces and a square tile set throughout the room. And so the players have to like look at the mural of the two armies being led by a queen, deduce that it's a chess that's referencing chess, then search the room for the chess pieces, and then put figure out to put them on the... Um, board in the center or in some way. It's basically just a force the players to think instead of like just act. So let's see here now. On to room three because we're just doing a very general rundown right now and then we'll go back and fill in stuff like that. So this is a trick or a setback. This could be something like, you know, Something's blocking the way, and the players have to find another way around, which may be a trap, or there could be two paths, and one of the paths leads off in the wrong direction, or they could f think they found, like, one of the items that they were sent here to retrieve, but secretly cursed or broken. Hmm... Let's see here. Let's. I want this to be a kind of trap, but not like an exceptionally deadly or dangerous trap. Let's go ahead and pull open. Our copy of Xanathar's. Xanathar's Guide to Everything has a really nice section on complex traps that, um require a lot more than just like the I search the area with perception to find it, investigate it, to figure out how to shut it off and stuff like that. So, complex traps. Let's see. Yeah, that I, I like that idea of glyphs which show movement paths for the chess pieces. Um... I try and do things that can be uh, designed, things that can be played either in person or on a virtual system, so I try to avoid anything that requires like physical props to be handled. No rush equilibrium, we're going to be here for a little while while I uh, ponder through this stuff. So let's see here now, Xanathar's. So, complex trap. And I've used a couple complex traps in my, pre in my um, home games. Uh, one of my favorite ones was uh, the room sealed and started filling with um, a gas. And the only way to shut off the gas was to get to some, a... Uh, the only safe place from the gas was in a little five-foot square in the center of the area. But if you stood on that five-foot square in the center of the area, it jetted flame at you. And if you tried to get to any of the areas where the gas was spraying off of, runes of fear or something would trigger and force you to run away. And so the players had to figure out, like, okay, first we need to get into get the dis disable the flame jets, and then we need to disable the. Uh, the runes, and then we can finally stop the gas. So let's see here now. We're just going to look through this real quick, and basically we are going to need a trigger, because it can't be running when the players come in. A 
active element. A dynamic element. And a cons constant element. And countermeasures. So let's see here, checking. Ah, welcome back, Equilibrium. Yeah, this is definitely a, um, like this is about saying, uh, we definitely want this to be a setback and not a lethal trap. So what it's going to be is that's a combination of two or three setback simple traps. Not dangerous ones. So let's see here now. Don't want a deadly trap. Don't want a deadly trap. Going through my little list of uh, traps. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard me talk about before, it is super important that you keep documents of just ideas or things that you've designed. Then. Uh, riddles are in this all collects into this kind of archive that you can draw from later so let's see here now traps level one setback only so huh. let's go with a the first one is when the players cross in, across the center of the room. Okay, so when the players cross the center of the room, the trap triggers. The active element, this is like what happens when they trigger it. Uh, the room seals. And let's see here. Let's go with Runes of Perilous. On the door. That way if anyone goes to the door and gets the bright idea of prying it open, they have to beat a uh, DC 15 to avoid from being paralyzed for a number of rounds. So the dynamic element, this is the mechanical effect that's constantly going. And this is what makes the thing, or sorry, this is the dynamic. This is what is going like back and forth to, you know, provide a consistent threat. And you can have two or three, but we're going to just go with, um, we are, I'm going to go with magic missile. I like Magic Missile, and it's fairly low damage. Every turn, the players are targeted by a Magic Missile for 1d4 plus 1. So it's not a huge amount of damage. But uh, it's enough to, you know, okay, we need to think and hurry. We can't just, like, fool around or assume that we're going to be fine. So the constant element. This is the one that I was thinking about when I was talking about the dynamic element. This is a progressive, constant thing that's going on. Uh, which we don't really need because the doors are sealed. Which acts as the um, constant element as well, because it traps them in there. So we can just scrap that for now, at least. We can come back and edit it later. Never be afraid to come back and edit. So, countermeasures, dispel magic would, of course, uh, but that's a pretty high level spell. Uh, I don't expect the players to have that. So, let's say. 
An Arcana check will let the players disable the magic missile for 1d4 turns. A and at this low level, I'm going to say it's a DC 10. And that will buy the players four turns, but it will also force them to continually make that um, DC Arcana check to stop the magic missiles from coming at them. So you have one player being forced to near constantly like okay i i have to keep uh, this from going off again otherwise we're in trouble this is the equivalent of like hold this lever otherwise we're all going to get flooded with lava a dc 10 check will hi hugs welcome to the stream we're designing a uh five room dungeon for a spell jammer mission how are you doing today oh uh okay word we're not playing this game i generally try and tap stuff in but in some situations it just the it looks weird i'm just going to have to deal with that a dc 10 check well is necessary N E C C needed uh i'm not making a campaign this is the equivalent of a one shot I will be doing a campaign later. Uh, this is just a... We've been doing a series in the past several uh, episodes where we've designed a Spelljammer ship, we've designed a Spelljammer crew, now we're designing a mission for that crew or the players to go on. And then next week we will be designing a kind of settlement home base for the Spelljammer and it, ship and its crew to... Uh, use for downtime activities and stuff like that. Uh, we're not doing like uh, a game session today, uh, but this when I finish this project, it'll be available on the DMs Guild uh, as a pay what you want, and uh, you can have uh, it, you can either run it or you can have a friend of yours run it. Your call. Let's see here. So a DC 10 check is needed to disable the. Perilous runes. And finally, a DC 15 strength. Oh. Have to remember to note what kind of checks to make. And DC 15 strength. Check is required to open the door so what happens is when the players enter the room it seems fine safe like the uh the previous room where they uh one of the previous rooms where they fought the bronze scout having fought a, a scout in this in a similar room they're expecting a combat encounter Warily, they cross the path, uh, and when they hit the middle of the room, the trap triggers, the doors slide down and seal, the perilous runes appear on the door, and then, say, from, like, a well in the center of the room... Oh, yeah, we have a, a wiki. It's down below. Uh, it's not an active link. You'll have to copy and paste it, because I... I'm not an expert at setting these things up just yet, but uh, we do have a wiki. It has uh, information on GM's Brew episodes, on GM's Review episode, and on our weekly uh, Dungeons & Dragons game, uh, Second Side Agency, set in Ravnica. Where was I? Okay. Door seal, perilous runes appear, and like a something, either a crystal descends from the ceiling, or from the floor or a mouth opens up on the wall however you want to skin it and a rune inside there glows and shoots out a uh, a uh, magic missile that hits each of the people in the room 
so they have to disable the magic missile so that they have time to work on that. You have to get close to the uh, Perilous Rune, which will trigger the Perilous Rune. So that buys forces the players to that the forces the player that is countering the uh, magic missile to do another check on the magic missile to keep it from triggering. Probably, eventually the perilous runes wear off, or someone else comes and beats the perilous rune DC, and then they have to do. A DC 15 is a high enough strength check. It's unlikely that any one player is going to be able to do it solo. They will need to have work together to get advantage to get that door open, and then they'll hold the door open while everyone runs out past. And once the players are out of the room, the trap ends, resets, whatever, and they will have to deal with it on the way back out unless they figure out, like, you know, some way of bypassing it. And again, this is just like the rule of, like, this is not hard set. You don't have to go with this. If you want to let your players come up with something else, like, they shove something that they've been carrying with them into the mouth of the uh, statue that's shooting the, um, shooting the magic missiles out, that's fine. Uh... Let your players be creative. Let the solution that they come up with does not necessarily have to be the solution you planned. It just needs to be a solution that makes sense. <sighs> I love traps. I really do. I have done trap-filled dungeons, and people have, like, no, we're not doing this. <laughs> Hello, Meryl! Oh, yeah. Yeah, we should probably... Uh, what Zisipa is referring to is the uh, complex trap I was talking about earlier, where they ended up having... They ended up ripping up uh, a tapestry that they had found earlier and shoving it scraps into the uh, gas vents that was filling the room with toxic gas. So, let's see here now. We're on to room four. This is the climax, the big battle or the conflict. So, let's see here now. This needs to be something at this level that is a hard fight. But not so hard as to, like, you know, wipe everyone because they've already taken a decent bit of damage. And honestly, since this is a non-linear format, you can give the players a room to stop and take a short or even a long rest in if they need it, because otherwise they're going to be hesitant to continue on if they've taken a lot of damage, or if they've expended a lot of spell slots. Just keep in mind that in other situations, a player taking a long rest in a dungeon can lead can give it, uh, options to the monsters that it didn't have beforehand. So, in this situation, since we're planning this for a one-shot or an introductory adventure, it's probably not a bad idea to let them take a break either, a uh, either after the Bronze Scout fight or even after the Complex Trap, or both. If they want to go slow, let them go slow because it, this is the first level can uh, first adventure that they're in and they're filling out, feeling out their character and getting a feel for what they can do. So, we already had one fight, we had a puzzle, and we had a trap. So let's do like a one more really big fight to make them feel like they've earned it. Uh, earned like the XP, the victory, and stuff like this. Hmm. Let's see here. Pulling up my little list of stuff oh I like this idea in Tomb of Annihilation there were terracotta warriors uh, these statues are not super tough in fact if you score a critical hit against them it shatters and destroy is destroyed automatically uh, a single one of them is probably the equivalent of the bronze scout 
So having two, I think, yeah, two of these and like going with the whole, these are forged clerics and this is their armory. It would make sense to be like their dwarves and they're holding like the magic weapons that the players have come to retrieve. So, so by fighting them, they can get a couple of the weapons. Uh, they'll make them feel like, oh, hey, this is a big reward. And then the players can move on to the final room, which is going to be the true reward, the, a revelation, or a, or a plot twist. Or all three if you want. So let's see. Room is guarded. Two... And if you don't know, like, these stat blocks, or don't worry um, too much, these are not going to be the official stat blocks from the game in all probability, um, but uh, my variations on them, which I will go back in and fill out later. Let's see here now. Oh, hello, Tux. Did not see you sneaking. <laughs> Luckily, you're using yourself as a battery. I forget anything. Okay, so what Zizva is referring to is um, during the Tome of Annihilation, I had them go into a little ziggurat five room dungeon kind of situation where they needed to go in, find out what was happening to people, and clear it out. Uh, one of our players had won a pet. Dinos, a pet raptor, I believe, in a contest or as a reward for a mission or winning a race, I think. I'm not 100% sure. The, 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 this pet character was a barbarian, so did not have a high uh, wisdom score, and so ended up doing things like being trapped by a Oh, welcome back, Equilibrium. Thanks for advertising. Really appreciate it. We are still trying to get, like, a couple more followers. Uh, oh, we're just talking and uh, filling stuff out. Um, let's see here now. I'm going to be going back over this a couple times anyway. But, let's see. We're almost to the point that we're finished with this, and we can go and do, like, some questions and answers and talks about stuff. But, uh, I don't know. Let's see here. Terracotta Warriors. Where was I? Terracotta Warriors. That's where I was. Holding. So we can't just use the base stats of the Terracotta Warriors from the game. Uh, because one that's not SRD base material. And... To, um, it's a little boring. It's something people have seen before. So we're going to give them some magic weapons to make them a little bit more tough. And if the players survive beat, they get those magic weapons as a reward. So let's see. Room five: reward, revelation, and plot or plot twist. <laughs> um. This doesn't always have to be a physical location. In some cases, it's not even. It's like the map. It's, um, you go back and, uh, you report to whoever hired you and they pay you or they double cross you. So, I mean, yeah, I kind of like that idea. But, hmm. So, two Terracottas magic warriors that beat it. They re retrieve the magic items that they came here to get. They go back. They return the key to the Archmage. Yeah, I was like, I like this. I like this. The Archmage forces the players to... one of the weapons. 
or replace it with something of their own design. So, I mean, these are dwarves, and uh, anyone that knows much about dwarves know that they don't... Oh, okay. Uh, anyone know about who's done much research on dwarves knows that dwarves are very much about... This is my craft, then treat like some of their higher quality works as well as they would treat their children. So, the Archmage, being the person that designed these, would be like, I will let you take one of them, because you need it. If you want the other one, you have to replace it with something that you designed, so you know what it's like to create something and have to leave it or let it go. And so that forces the players into a situation where it's like, do we really need or want both of these? what can we create or design and forces them into another roleplay situation. Okay. So I kind of like this. I mean, it needs to be flushed out a bit. It needs a name for one thing. Uh, let's go ahead and figure out exactly how many golems there are. Oof. Okay. Six golems. So there's a lot of these things. I'm seeing these not as, like, since they're dwarf made, they're not huge, but they're, like, big, bulky, d iron, metal dwarves, maybe double the size. Make it clear that these are not things that the players want to fight, unless the players are incredibly suicidal. Let's see, how many priests... Oh, hey, I'm rolling max today. Four priests. And these are forge priests, forge clerics. Which is very much a dwarf priest. It's very much a we craft as a holy action. And let's see if I roll max on the acolytes as well. Five, six, seven, seven Acolytes. That's not bad. That's a decent number. And the Acolytes in this case would function as, like, you know, the choir boy, the, uh, the temple attendant, or in this case, the apprentices that are learning how to craft. And the Archmage is a, uh, Artificer. He designs the things and then passes them on to the priests who then create it with the help of the acolytes and then it is stored in the armory for a later point. So we will refer to him as the Grand Design Crafter. Craftsman, Crafter, Design, Grand Crafter. Let's see here. Story hooks, armory. Oh, island. Oh, I like that weaponsmith. Thank you, Tux. And we're going to change this to defenses. Because it's a planet, there's probably a good deal more people on there. But these are what is immediately there. Let's see here now. Story hooks. So the entrance to Guardian. That forces roleplay and that forces a combat. Role-playing challenge, or puzzle challenge in this case. Trap setback, quality. So yeah, I mean, this is, like, literally, this is a one-sheet done, uh, one-sheet adventure. Uh, literally, like, 
uh, this is what I go into one shots with in most cases. And uh, but I mean, it took about an hour to go to design this all from start to finish. We can go in and we can do some more refinement, like detailing out what the rooms are like, or what the Archmage's personality is, or creating NPCs for the priests and the acolytes. But really, just have like a list of names. <laughs> well, I mean, that's why I'm doing this show, Meryl. So that uh, people learn, like, my techniques uh, and can use those techniques to develop their own. I mean, that's all that there is. And, I mean, some of this I pulled from my archive, like, with the Ruins of Paralyzation. I didn't copy that stuff down. There's fine-tuning that needs to be done. But, for the most part, this is, like, a one-sheet that's done. I'll, I'll refine it some more and send it on to Ziziva to get it uploaded to the... Uh, the wiki later and uh, the refined version will be in the uh, spell jammer packet uh, the upcoming village is not necessarily going to be elf but it is going to have some elves in it I haven't 100% figured out demographics for what's coming up next week we are doing a oh wait you're talking to Meryl about the game aren't you yeah, you're talking to Mara about the game. Sorry. Uh, in addition to the Sunday game I stream, we play in a game that Meryl is kind enough to run. Um, which is what that conversation was about. Uh, next week, I am doing a kind of village setting um, that will have like a little spaceport for Spelljammer ships to come in and out of, and it'll have like three or four different locations for players to visit but I think this is pretty much done for this I'm willing to chill for about 30 minutes or so if people have questions or ideas or stuff like that that they want to uh, talk to about or have me take a look over and work on with y'all let me just create a new page fresh page really fresh page uh, let's see here. Oh, got plenty of people want listen. So, uh, anyone have anything they want to uh, work on or have questions about? Uh, this is just a reminder that uh, we are looking for more followers on our uh, Twitch channel. The more followers we have, the better off we're doing because it means we can get close to being able to. Let's see. Uh, anything you can do will help. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much for hosting this Equilibrium. Uh, stuff like that, where Equilibrium has just hosted us, uh, is one of the ways that we can increase the people who are following us. Uh, Twitch has some very specific requirements for, uh, you know, making affiliate and partner. Uh, and doing the GM's Brew Packets is another way that I'm trying to bring in a little funding to help cover some of the costs of like the wiki and upgrading and replacing equipment uh, to facilitate that because we don't want to just do something for I expect people to do something for nothing we're doing giveaways like the dice giveaway that we do we try and do weekly uh, our basic requirements for that is if we go up five followers we didn't go up five followers last week and so we didn't do the dice giveaway but uh, the dice are still on the table. One more follower will get us to that, and I will do that giveaway uh, at the start of the game Sunday. And if we get another five followers after that to get us to our goal of 40 for this week, then I'll do a second dice giveaway that day. Um, we have a YouTube channel. You can find it by searching YouTube for the bonus roll. And it's just these videos... Uh, and our game videos uploaded so you don't have to sit and watch them in a four hour or an hour and a half block you can pick up when and where you want because I understand like it's difficult to listen to people role play for four hours or longer even if you freaking love the them and their role playing so uh, I am looking at getting us on a couple different podcast apps as well once I figure out 
how to go about doing that. Yeah, time zones. Time zones are fun. We're there's a possibility we may be I'm we're central I'm central time zone, which is why everything is like listed in central time zones so that I don't get confused by that and show up like an hour late. But yeah. GM's Brew has a lot more um, me interacting with chat, so it will probably not become a podcast. Equilibrium, I really appreciate everything you are doing to spread the word. Uh, definitely uh, appreciate anything you can, anything you can do for us. Uh, do not expect it. I appreciate it, but don't feel like you have to put yourself out for us. Um, yeah, like what Tex said. So, uh, anyone have anything that they wanted to work on or question or an idea that I can help figure out? Uh, normally we have, like, Amy Chibby in here and she's, like, throwing out three or four ideas. I guess she wasn't able to make it today. I do appreciate the people that regularly log in and even just listen even if y'all don't chat I see y'all there under the um, users and I appreciate you being there it means a lot to me that I see the same names three or four times uh, at, in or the same three or four names in like almost every uh, chat stream that we do it means that some people like us and that we keep coming back uh, GM's brew right now uh I like waffles, but pancakes are easier. Uh, GM's Brew right now is going to be focusing on D&D for a little bit. Because there's a lot of buzz around it. And it's one of the things that I'm like on top of. But I plan to eventually do stuff like uh, Shadowrun. And possibly even a couple other things. And maybe at some point my own homebrew system will get finished. And I will sit down and talk with y'all about it. Hmm. We also have a Twitch. I mean a Twitter. You can follow us on uh, Twitter at Bonus Roll. It's mostly just announcements like... Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, I will allow that, Meryl. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, in the monster manual. Well, I mean, the default generally is like Cambrions and, um, you know, uh, Incubi and Succubi. That's just like the general answer that everyone would expect. Uh, the one that I would lo I love seeing the most in games, so that's a different story. Let me pull up my short list of monsters from there. So, let's see here. I love the dragons. Fairy dragons are adorable. Genies are always fun. Hmm. Harpies are both mine and I believe Zizava's favorite monster, or not harpies, hags. <laughs> uh, oh, I missed that. Yeah, uh, it's a little early to be talking about too much, but we do have a plan for another campaign once the second side agency begins. I like harpies too. I'm just saying that hags are one of mine and Zizava's favorite monsters. Where was I? We have a campaign that we will be playing after the Second Sight Agency campaign ends, which probably won't be for, I don't know, y'all, the players are level 5 now. I plan on running it as far as I can, which means 20. Oh, oh if you actually finish a pen and paper game, I would love to take a look at it. My favorite non-D&D or Shadowrun tabletop role-playing game. Wow. Well, there's a couple options on that one that's difficult to choose from. 
Uh, let's see here now. I love um, Exalted. Uh, there are some issues with Exalted 3rd Edition that need to be dealt with. Uh, Scion was really good too. Both of those are by, by White Wolf uh, through Onyx Path Publishing. Let's see here now. Blue Rose was a nice little system that I ran across a while back that never really got the attention that it deserved in its initial uh, release, but I think it's become like one of the a groups or... <laughs> Monopoly is an experience. Let's see here. Dresden Files is definitely a good one. Um, Pathfinder is... I have issues with how long Pathfinder First Edition ran. Paranoia and The Laundry are both great games from what I've read. Um, I've played Ironclaw and Jade Claw. Uh, Shard is a very underrated, virtually unknown system that I just fell in love with years ago and have tried to, like, replicate the parts of it that I really enjoyed being like the template system where you can you choose like okay this is what my character's race is this is what my character's background is this is what my character's profession is and each of those stack on top of each other to give you like your stats your attributes your abilities and then you have a number of points to spend on doing things like customizing or getting your own weapon and has a really unique magic system uh, I have played and run for non-humanoids before it's one of those it takes some special consideration um, there's actually a system called pony finder and tales of equestria which deal very well with uh, non-humanoids Yeah, uh, the professions in Shard definitely make you feel more tied to your location. Uh, there are actually, there is actually a new Shard book that came out a while back that I have not been able to find a copy of. Um, that is supposed to expand on their magic system and their martial arts system, I believe. It's on my watch for it list. Uh, but, I mean... Non I mean, if you want to be real fun about it, uh, there's a one-sheet adventure set called Honey Heist that uh, Critical Role Brand has run a couple games of, where you're play you're literally playing bears, and there's like a similar one called Crash Pandas where you're uh, raccoons and taking part in a race. There, those are both better for. Um, the, the number of dice that is too many dice is equivalent to one greater than the number of dice that you need. Role-playing game for sock puppets. I remember what you're talking about. I can't remember the name of it. Speaking of kids' role-playing books, uh, I'm very excited by the Young Adventure series that have been coming out. Uh, I have two of them, th and I want to get the uh, Wizards and Spells that's coming, that is either out or is coming out soon. Oh, there was a Firefly. There's actually been two or three Firefly RPGs, but I like the most recent one better. It's kind of uh, Savage World group style, where it's more flexible than the older systems were. <sighs> Let's see here. But yeah, no, honestly, I would love to do a shard game now that I'm talk talking about it out loud. It's one of those systems that it has it doesn't have any humans in it. Uh, pretty much all the all players are anthropomorphized animals of some sort. Um, I don't know if that's changed with the more recent book and it has like a what? A shard game? We'll talk about it. Uh, I think I still have the email of the people that are, like, owner in charge of it. There was some drama around it. Yeah, I know. I don't know why I'm setting myself up for this. But, yeah, I, I mean, I want to do this for a living. I want to be able to sit here and talk to y'all about games and sit here and Dungeon Master uh, or 
game master or storytell or whatever it is on a near <laughs> Argyle and crew wow that is an adorable name but I just got completely distracted by my whole passionate speech about I literally want to do this for a living I want to be able to sit here tell y'all about games and then be able to go and have dinner and then look forward to coming back and playing games for y'all's entertainment and that's I mean that's really what I want to do if that's not what I end up doing I'm still going to do this even if it's not making me any money because I have fun doing this and I hope y'all have fun watching this uh, what I told everyone when I we sat down and like figured out the name for the bonus role and stuff like that was look if we get big that's great if we don't get big that's fine I'm doing this because I want to have fun and I want to do this with y'all and everyone agreed with that I mean Ziz you really really like deep onto that shadow run stuff right now but I'll tell you what things work out if I'm running Shadowrun, if I'm running uh, the D&D campaign, and we can figure out another day to do it, I'll work on doing a Shard stream as well. Because I want you to play that Tea House owner. Because it's no fault of yours that that fell through. That was other people, and we're not going to get into that because life is life, and don't get hung up on that stuff. So, we've been going for about... <laughs> uh, that is the problem. Yeah, never enough days of the week, never enough people free. We are looking to eventually expand our playership. I do like Fun's Day. Fun's Day would be a good day to add. Just slide that... <laughs> Alright, we'll just slide it right in there between Saturday and Sunday. Sorry, lost my train of thought for a second. But that's the fun part about being a world, world builder and stuff like that is that you get all these tools for these great things and you start seeing the way the world could be and the way you want the world to be. And then you have people come and it's like, hey, can we play a game? And there are the best thing in the world is being able to say, let's play a game. And when a person says, I want to do this, being able to say, I have stats for that. Like, if you follow me on Twitter, I am I have my own Twitter that you can find through uh, the Bonus Rolls Twitter. I don't think time works like that, Tux, but um, most of my experiments with time traveling involve, like, nails and jumper cables and car batteries and waking up three or four days later with a headache, so I... I can't tell you. But anyway, I lost my train of thought again. I'm very ADHD today. Is that why it's called October? No, I'm kidding. That's Octo. Yeah. Duh. It's the same reason why an octopus is called an octopus. It's got eight. Oh, that's another one. Uh, what is that? The one with the uplifted octopi. Uh, not Event Horizon. Um, oh. I'm going to have to Google games now. There's no, nothing, not, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying. So, yeah, I think we're pretty much going to be done with this. I will refine this sheet, send it off to Zizva. It'll get uploaded to the wiki. Um, I will include stat blocks in it of my own design that are with, uh based on the actual ones in the game for uh, consumption and use that won't get me sued by Wizards of the Coast. Uh, but yeah, no. Um, keep an eye on the wiki. Read through the wiki. 
keep an eye on uh, at bonus roll on Twitter for announcements of uh, new episodes of GM's Review as more Unearthed Arcana comes out or I get my grubby little mitts on books. I'm hoping to do one either on the 17th or the 18th. Uh, sorry, I'm hoping to do a GM's Review on the 17th or the 18th for Descent into Avernus because that's when the plebeians like me managed to get our hands on it. We weren't able to get early copies. But yeah, anyway, I'm not bitter at all about the fact that there are all are already reviews for Descent into Avernus out. Not at all. Uh, keep an eye on Twitter, keep an eye on Twitch, follow us on, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on here. Uh, basically just, like, give us all your social media attention that you can so that uh, we can go to places and be all like, hey, look at us. We are here and we do this thing and we're just normal people. <laughs> uh, not soon enough, but yeah. Hey, that's. I mean, I. I'll right now. I'll be happy to get to 50 followers so we can make the argument for um, affiliate, and then I don't know. Yeah, sponsorship would be nice. It's one of those like monetization. It will eventually come, but it's never going to be a requirement. I'm never going to say like you have to pay to have access. Actual question, MTG. Uh, I don't know if that was actually a question, but I will say, at, in response to actual question, MTG, yes. Yes, there is actual question, MTG. Anyway, um, yeah. We'll have a patron eventually. Um... And actually, one of the things we discussed earliest when we were doing this is um, when we have the patron up, we'll be doing things like um, putting the first, the three pregame videos, like before the bonus roll went live, where it was Zizava playing Ingrid for the first time, getting the feel for her character, and uh Demage playing Grigum for the first time and getting a feel for his character, and uh, Tux and Meryl playing uh, Fair Deer and Rail and going on a little mission on that, all before they met up in game. Uh, I want to do things like hold an actual like weekly role playing session for uh, a handful of the patrons, where hey, you are a patron, you're entered into this. Uh, pool and every week I will draw five players and we will do a one shot like I just designed <laughs> uh, K was in it too don't forget K but uh, we are coming up on the player scene level five in second side agency um, at that point they will be given the option to do one more rebuild uh, oh, appreciate Equilibrium. Thank you. Uh, once the players hit level 5, that will be the final rebuild they're allowed. So, guys, if you're hearing this and you're watching this and you haven't already decided if you're going to stay exactly the same or if you're going to rebuild in some way, start thinking on that. Y'all aren't too far away from finding what y'all are looking for. Or what you're looking for isn't too far away from finding you. Or you, what you're looking for is far away finding... Yes. <laughs> but yeah, no. Um, watch for the Patreon to go live sometime soon after we hit 50 followers. That was our basic litmus. Uh, or at least my basic litmus for, like, if we get 50 followers, then yes, we'll actually put up the patron. We actually have the patron, and uh, it's not launched, but we have the account. We have a Ko-Fi account and stuff like that. Um, just set 
I just set those up right when we get started to make sure that we would be able to have the names. Uh, but, yeah. I think I'm going to call it a day. Appreciate you all coming and listening to me ramble and babble and talk. What's up, America? Welcome to the stream. I was just about to end it, but just for you, I'm going to stick around for a few more minutes. Thank you for following. Oh my god, thank you! This Sunday, we'll be giving away this set of dice. No, I'm, I'm sticking around. That was, well, like, coming in and following, that was well worth it. I got some another birth of energy. Give me a second to drink some tea. Oh, nice. I mean, we're still a week behind of our goal. But, oh my god, that is, like, just a rush. Like, someone came in and followed, and now I get to give away this nice set of gold blue alliance dice. And it will come to you in this... Where's my little bucket? It will come to you in this nice little bag with the bonus roll logo if you win. These were hand... Well, the bags weren't handmade, but the logos were uh, added by Zizva herself. She made me this whole little prize grab bag of stuff. Gravity. If we can get another five followers before Sunday, we'll give away this pack as well. Oh. Woo. So, in a quick recap, since uh, What's Up America just now joined us, we did a uh, quick little one-page adventure build. Yeah. So, uh, we did this one quick, this quick little one-page adventure build. This is like, you know, you're getting pe people introduced, you're gaining new ga characters, or you're getting a new game going. We don't have a title for it yet. I'll come up with something, or if anyone has any title suggestions that they want to throw out. Right now, I'm thinking uh, Sanctum of the Grand Weaponsmith, just because it is nominative and easy. That's the idea. And I am working on uh, looking into international rules and regulations for shipping stuff for people out of state, out of country, because you're doing a lot for us, Equilibrium, and you really deserve to have a chance to enter into these contests as well. Um, it's defended by a, p a bunch of priests, some glo golems, and some acolytes. Those people are not there to fight you. Those people are there to point you towards the uh, armory. In the armory, there's a bunch of stuff that's not going quite right. And the players, having heard of the armory of the Grand Weaponsmith, want to get their hands on those shiny, shiny weapons. So. <coughs> set down. These people haven't are just like, uh, what's the term for it? Aesthetic. They're separated. They're off on their own. They don't get a lot of people coming by. They're self-sufficient for the most part. So, the news that the, play the players bring with them of the outside world is more than enough payment for these people for inns and lodgings. And enough role-playing will get them into the Archmage where they can get permission to go into the armory. The Archmage can tell people, like, Oh, well, we have a number of problems lately. If you can get in there and you can get a couple of weapons out, uh, we'll see what we can do for you. And he gives them like this nice, solid, adamantine, laced with mithril and gold etching key that's like the size of one of their forearms. Uh, and so they are off to the the entrance. And inside there they go in and the first thing in the enter room is like this stone room with like nothing in it. They take a few steps in and then all of a sudden this like creature of clockwork bronze and metal plates with scraping hinges hauls itself out of the stone and launches itself out at them. It's an intense fight. The players dominate eventually and they move on to the next room. They go down to down through some twists and turns into this lavish room with a um, a mural on one wall of these two queens, these two dwarf qu qu queens 
at the back of imposing armies launching at each other with um, like a pedestal in the center with a cross grid and the entire room is just one puzzle and they figure out like oh they're wait two queens army and then they can find the inscription written in dwarvish or uh, somewhere in the room that says uh, 30 men but only two women yet these two hold the most power dressed in black and white they could fight forever who are they and so they realize chess pieces they see the grid on there they oh okay we need to set up a chess board and so then they can either find chess pieces that are hidden throughout the room to put on there with like a series of investigation and searches or they can put like stone pebbles on each of the chess boards like it's at the start of a chess game or some other solution that they come up with all that you need as a dm is it's a chess based pro puzzle and it has a chess based solution with that the door opens and it creaks and they come into this nice little room with it looks like there's like a bowl a sensor of water on a p pedestal inside there and they watch her wander in. They approach the pedestal maybe to come and get a drink of water. And as they do, the tr doors slam down on either side of the room and sh seal. Glowing glyphs start appearing along the edges of the walls and centered on the um, the doors. And while they're looking around at that, bolts of energy erupt out of the water and circle around the room slamming into each of them. And they've triggered the complex trap. And they have to figure out how to stop the magic missiles from firing out of the bowl like by covering it or emptying it or whatever solution they come up with as long as it leads to an arcana check and then I, they empty it and the water starts filling back up and they know like oh when it fills back up it's going to start firing again or when they cover it up energy starts glowing through the threads of the cloth <laughs> this is first level, unfortunately, so Counterspell and Dispel Magic is a bit outside that range, which is good. You don't want them to just come in and Counterspell it away right away, unless that's what you, the resource you're wanting to eat up. So, that energy, the fact that they have to keep on emptying the bowl or covering it, they have a limited time before they start getting hurt again. They start searching the room, they approach the doors... Thank you, Tux. That's another one uh, option. They, whatever they do, and like, they approach the doors, and as they approach the doors, the f runes flare, and like the first two person that approaches the door freezes in place, paralyzed for a couple turns, and so they say, "Okay, here's another part," and they start working out like, "Okay, if we deface the damage, if we figure out the what the passcode is, or we." unwind the magic that's paralyzing people. Okay, we can get access to the door. Now let's get under there. Get your fingers under there. Work together. Two people. Pry it up. Force it up. Hold it up while everyone else gets through. You slide through and like crash! The, 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 the door slams down behind them until you're coming back. And it's opened again. And it leads into this nice little kind of a sitting area. It's a ritual room with an altar. And the players come in and they've been attack they've been challenged with puzzles they've been hit with uh traps and they come into this room and it's quiet they can catch their breath they can sit down for a minute and heal they can treat their wounds they can get a drink they can take an hour rest and recuperate maybe even longer rest if they want they're breathing they went through trials and tribulations, but they came out the other side and they have this moment. And at the other end of the of the room, a single door remains. They go through it. And inside this room are two terracotta, terracotta warrior dwarves holding glistening weapons of mithril and adamantine and standing at like the ready pose, like they're guarding some significant treasure and maybe there is a significant treasure maybe there's like stacks of adamantine and mithril ingots behind them or a urn full of gold coins and gems but as the players approach thinking we have made it 
they realize they have one more challenge as they approach the dwarves bring their blades up to the ready position and they rush forward in another fight and this is like the fight this is two ancient proto golems fighting with magical weaponry and like one of the players lands a critical hit and as it does the terracotta warrior like takes another step crumbles and then just shatters its weapon falling to the ground the other fight goes on until the players finally beaten crush it take the weapon for themselves and change the escape room I like that yeah there's no long rest there's no penalty against the long rest there's no penalty against the short rest this is a first level adventure you want them to be able to rest up and take a break if they need it but the two terracotta warriors finally beaten the whole of the dungeon behind them they turn back the players turn back the doors to the um the trapped room are open carrying the weapons with them the trap doesn't trigger as the room now recognizes that oh hey you have a part of the a part of this place with you you're allowed to pass they go back through they go to return the key to the archmage and the archmage looks at it and it's like you have done well but I cannot allow you to take both. You may choose one, the other must remain, lest you, unless you are willing to replace it with something of your own design. If that is the case, you have access to our workshop. And so then the players have to work together to, do we create something? Do we run? You have a moral choice here. You can run, try and run with it, and have to face those people the defenders and probably never be welcome back here possibly even have holy pre forge priests sent after you to retrieve the weapon that you stole do you work together to design a magic item uh that is composite of all the players ideas and then work with the forge priests to actually see that br brought into existence and would you the players be willing to give up that creation that they worked and designed simply to get the one that they fought for or will they surrender the one they fought for for the one that's ultimately their own creation i mean seeing down i mean that's all just from like this that and my imagination and what i thought of and that's my take on it you may have a completely different tank take. You probably have a completely different tank. If you have a tank, please let me know. Yeah, there are um, a few cursed items that are minus one that are not because you're not intended to use them in combat. But I think that's one we'll work on for another time. Remember that, though, Toxin suggested. Uh, what's up, America? Thank you for joining us. I'm sorry it's, like, right at the very end of this. I have been going for, like, an hour and a half at this point. Um, we w I will be back with my the uh, bonus role players this Sunday for uh, Second Side Agency. We are getting really, really close to uh, announcing the Shadowrun game. Uh basically i need to finish up the overlay we need to decide on a title and then we'll put the announcement out uh follow us on uh twitch uh here follow us on twitter at bonus roll subscribe to us on youtube at by just searching for us at the bonus roll and yeah i hope you all have a great day because i had a lot of fun doing this and i hope you all enjoyed the show too